because I already had this up on my screen. This actually just went out, like, uh, the actual release just went out this morning for WP GraphQL ACF 49 minutes ago. Um, so the this uh, release focused on, for anybody who is using the uh, ACF or has, you know, customers or whatever using it, I don't know. Uh, this release focused on polishing and fixing some bugs around the group and clone fields. Um, I don't need to spend that much time on it unless anybody has questions about it. It's uh, very complicated. I, I got to say supporting clone fields in ACF to GraphQL is probably one of the more complicated things I've worked on in my career. I'm not going to lie. It's like, uh, it's a, it's really cool. Like when, when it works, you're like, man, this is amazing, but holy crap, it's complicated. Um, yeah. So there, that, that fixes some bugs and that, does tie in with the related uh with the WP GraphQL release. Um I I was I was I able to identify that the way interfaces are applied. Uh let's see. Like if if you have a interface that is a uh if you have an interface that implements another interface and then object types that implement that interface, which implements another interface. Like we were having these weird like recursion issues um, that were, it wasn't infinite recursion, but it was, uh, we were we were asking to like merge things that didn't need to be merged basically, right? Like we were, we were, we were over, over merging, <laughs> I guess, or whatever. Like we're, we're saying like, hey, this field from this interface needs to be merged to this interface, which also already has that field, but we're still going to like go through the work and do it. And then this type that already has that field, we're still going to go and get the field from the interface and bring it in. So it was like, we were doing a lot of like recycling of stuff and it, it was causing in my case, and a lot of users that reported, it was causing a lot of like out of memory issues on uh, in PHP. And it wasn't fully infinite recursion. Like you could like increase your memory and finally it would work. But it's just like doing too much work, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I was able to identify uh, an issue and I believe fix it. Uh, all my tests show it's fixed. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's this uh, PR3100. As as we've seen, though, this morning or last night or whenever, uh, folks have reported that it's changed their expectation of how things were working. But yeah, we had this. We had this thing the the this array merge recursive that was the problem. Basically, it was like merging everything, even though it didn't need to. So, um, but that said, it 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 is a change in behavior. We do have an issue for anybody who is following. Uh, this was yeah four hours ago. It looks like uh, they're saying they had a interface that was registered and. They had a resolver on a field on their interface that would return the correct value. And then they would register a object type that would have the not correct value in the resolver. And what they were saying used to happen is that this resolver would actually execute instead of this one. And that now this change, that's not working. I was like, well, they they brought this up in Slack and I was like, that sounds like it might be a regression, but it's a I think we've identified that this was a bug that they were using as a feature because what should be happening, the more specific thing, like th this is your fallback. If this resolver doesn't, or if this resolver on the object type doesn't exist, okay, try and use this one. If this resolver exists, execute this, right? We shouldn't be executing that. So they were, they were benefiting from a, uh, a bug as a feature which I'm surprised we haven't caught before, but the, uh, yeah, so yeah, anyway, we've had some conversation here, but I, uh, as you pointed out, um, yeah, I think I, I would agree. This is a, this is a bug that they were using as a feature. Jeff Taylor though, did, did point out in Slack to me yesterday as well, though, that he thinks he found a regression with this, um, where, if you register an interface field that has arguments, 
those arguments aren't coming along for the ride to the object. Because um, the entire resolver is replaced. Uh, it's not the result. It's not the resolver. It's the actual yeah. arguments to find on the field. Oh, like, okay. Like you used to at this level, you used to be able to define, or args, I mean, yeah. you still can. You can define args, and those args used to be merged into this. Like, so if you added args here, and then all you did was added an ID field with a resolver, the args would automatically be applied. And then it's not, the entire. It's what it's the entire ID array that's getting replaced, and not the <laughs> and not the children. Yeah. Uh, um. Kind of well, that's what used to happen, and now it's only pulling over a couple things. And mm -hmm. so, I, I think I oversimplified it. Um, mm -hmm. and we didn't have tests, so it's another thing, it's just exposing some gaps in testing. So, I think his is a legit regression. I think this one appeared to be a regression, but is actually identifying that we had a bug that should have never been working in the first place. Um, which also is a gap in testing, though, too. Um, but uh, but yeah. So so the some some action does need to happen here. But that's uh, one thing to keep in in mind if as you're upgrading is like this release may or may not require some attention. Um, All right, I'll and then this while we talk. Yeah, and then um, and then again. So yeah, like you said. Uh, oh, and I need to fix this. Thanks, Alex. Wait, is it? Um, so yeah, uh, Dover re, uh, refactored a bunch of stuff in our abstract uh, resolver and then some of the other resolvers that make use of it. Um, like this one, for example, we uh, deprecated uh, the, what is it, snake casing uh, functions. I had a bad habit for a long time, and I still have this habit. Like GraphQL uses what snake case and Pascal case, but then WordPress PHP standards use. No wait, am I doing that? Right? No. Yeah, yeah. Opposite, WordPress opposite. uses. We're snake using case snake case, and this is camel GraphQL case. uses camel case, and yeah, whatever. So like, I have a bad habit of mixing it because I'm like, one hand I'm doing GraphQL typing, and then the other hand I'm doing PHP and WordPress. So. We have a lot of stuff like this where it's using JavaScripty, you know, function names. So anyway, we deprecated those. They still exist. They'll just throw warnings or whatever in your logs telling you, hey, that you should uh you should update. So this is like the map to, to update. And then and then it improves um the efficiency. We had a lot of stuff that would fire multiple times, right? Like um filters that should have only executed once were executing several times in any given request, right? So this solves some of those problems by running the filter just the one time, then, you know, caching the response on the object and then referencing that. So the should see some tangible benefit. I don't know, probably depends on your situation, but there's probably going to be tangible performance benefits here. Um, but yeah, plugin authors should, if you are, if you are inheriting the, uh, Abstract connection resolver, you should update your code base. Um, or or right. wait a little, or wait a little yeah, bit. Yeah, or or that. Um, I mean, that's everything fine. just to <laughs> just to chime in. Um, <coughs> so all of this is basically backporting um, from some of our um, like hypothetical, like what would a better uh, connection resolver DX go? All this stuff is backwards compatible. Um, and all of it's like opt in. So like, yeah, you might be getting some like deprecation notices for now or doing it wrong. So it's not going to affect anything. Um, some of the improvements, um, like that actually like affect performance or DX, like the query amount handling or, or load, loader handling. Those are things that you can, when you want to opt into, uh, just keep in mind that there are going to be more of these backwards compatible, um, changes coming out. Uh, we'll probably talk about this later in the meeting, but there's already one PR open. There's a few more changes to the DX that we can improve, um, the fixing the bug finally on query classes, stuff like that. So if you if you don't need to, to refractor and you know that like other parts of your connection resolvers are going to be affected in the next release, at least afterwards, it might make sense to wait. Honestly, it's up to you. It's not like remediating any of these is hard work. It's really just search replace. 
That's all. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's uh, that was that release. I think that was kind of a yeah, it was connection resolvers and then that uh, interface recursion issue is the, the big thing from that. Um, and then okay, so that, that's like recent releases. Um, one, I guess one thing, cause we talked about this last time. So I'll just give you guys a, kind of an update where we're going with this, but the IDE we've been working on, um, we do have, we do have releases are, uh, putting out the, uh, zip artifact now. So you can, you can get the, uh, latest, you know, plugin artifact from the, the releases now. Um, if you want, I think it, I think it's pretty dope. I think you should, y'all should be using it. We're trying to figure out what the best plan is to get into core. Uh, and that probably brings us to the next topic then. Um, of what? I think we have a issue that we kind of started playing last time. Yeah. So what a what a I think I think one of the big things on my mind right now is the what what does two point look like right? Um, we have a ton of ideas. I think origin originally like if you asked me like I don't know a year ago, I had all these grand ideas for things I wanted to break like make these like massive breaking changes and do like a big release right. I think I've changed my mind on that and want to do like a a much a much more minor release that will still probably have some breaking changes, but not necessarily like big sweeping breaking changes right like um so i think i think uh i think we we need a bit one of one of my goals in the next like two to three months is to get at minimum graphql php updated which would mean we're dropping support for what is it php versions is it below 7.4 oh yeah below 7.4 <laughs> so 7 yeah. so 7 3 and below yeah yeah so I think I think that's my biggest priority is like let's get that done, right? Um so we, we've talked about okay, well, what does that look like practically? And so we've talked about okay, how do we prevent folks that do have auto updates on, right? From because core doesn't respect sender, as we know. Uh so if you enable auto updates and we release a 2.0. Guess what? You get auto updated and your site breaks. So uh, having a mechanism that prevents that when we release a major version is an important thing that we want to try and have solved before we do this. Uh, and then, then that will help us in the future as we do more sweeping breaking changes, right? Like the audience for this, I think, is small ish. Um, most i think i i put stats in one of one of these issues recently about like our usage stats for what php versions were on and below 7.4 is pretty minimal like I th it's hundreds of users i think but not thousands right um uh, what it, who it might not affect, even be hundreds um might be dozens <laughs> who it may affect um depending on exactly what like how far we're going with dropping uh, PHP seven point four support? It may affect plugins. Um, for example, like if we're not just like updating the dependency, but we also in this release, I'm not saying we should. Like I'm happy to release us three point like four months after after two yeah, 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 yeah. Now that we have this cadence, but like let's say we we're moving um, I don't know properties from doc blocks into the actual param types or or things that weren't supported before seven point three. So yeah, then, so yeah. then the thing, so then any classes that are being extended by extensions would also have to update. So that doesn't have to be in this, um, but just something to keep in mind as we're actually working on it is how do we like are we like how minimal are we actually keeping it? And we also have to um, account for code that supports uh, below seven point four and not just users that are on it. Yeah, I would. I'm. I'm leaning toward more minimal of like i want the impact to be more minimal right like, um i'm with that yeah um uh yeah because i th i think one thing that one thing i'm nervous of as a maintainer is like if it's too big of a sweeping ch of like if we do a release that has a ton of changes then yeah, folks are gonna a be big like community yeah exactly You're, folks are gonna be like i don't have the time to update so then all of a sudden i have 
you know, 30% of people on 2.0 and 70% of people on one point something. And then like, to your point, Hey, we want to add this other breaking change, you know, three months down the road, which maybe isn't even that big of a breaking change, but it's still breaking change. So all of a sudden we're on 3.0 and we still have 50% on one point something. And so it becomes like it as a open source project with very limited, you know, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Human resources, you know, it's like uh, I I can't commit personally to supporting like uh, massive numbers. So I I would prefer to keep breaking changes more focused when possible. So like if we just say hey we're dropping support, but we're not making any code changes, like we're not really making. There might be some underlying ones from GraphQL PHP that we'd have to call out, um, and maybe, uh, you know, um, but like I don't think it would be like. Hey, we're doing this and we're introducing, you know, we're rewriting strings with custom scalers and we're rewriting your, you know, connection filters and like all the, all these other crazy features that I have in my mind to do one day. I don't, I don't think we need to do all that. Um, so one, one thing I do want, one thing I do think I want to consider for this release though, is replacing the current graphical with the new graphical so i had an idea of like hey we can merge it and have both together at the same time but then that's like me committing to a little bit of tech debt of how do i have both of these and like now i have to introduce a new feature for which one you want to enable versus disable and like i'd rather personally probably just like introduce the new one here take the old one out so when you update to 2.0 you have the new one and going forward it's the new one if you have the, the i'd just put the old one in a plugin or whatever and you could go download it if you really want it but then uh then i don't have to maintain that like tech debt and mental whatever like uh of, like how to support both these things so i think i think that's one thing unless there's any objections there we'd probably i'll, I'll add that here um well i remember when we spoke last time um you were concerned about about replacing like calling the the new IDE like uh, official because it would limit yeah. the ability to iterate, which is yeah. one of the reasons for the feature flags. Yeah. So like if this is further along by then than hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, but like well, has your view on that changed? It it has it has largely because so the current state of the plugin uh so what one of one of our big focuses for that plugin and I think I talked about it a little bit last uh, meeting for but uh, for those that weren't here, whatever. Um, one of, one of the big things we're working on for that, and I can show you some of this. Like, oh man, like okay. So what? What? Are, I'll just I'll just visually show it. I don't need to look at these issues. Um, oh no, I don't have my looking side on here. Oh gosh, what is going on? All right, <laughs> I don't know. I have stuff started. What is happening? I don't know. I have something to do about it. Um, let me. I give them a second. Oh, come on. Let's... Okay, so um, yeah, so so the the idea, the idea, and the idea is to make this a pluggable thing, right? Um, the the previous one had a little bit of pluggability, but it kind of sucked, uh, to be honest. But the idea is that we want to have like APIs similar to Gutenberg, like register block type, register block panel, or like I don't know the names of all their APIs, but uh, very similar to WordPress itself, where you could register an admin bar item or a, you know, admin menu item or, you know, register a post type or register taxonomy. We want to have APIs where you can like register 
what we call like uh, plugins right here, right? That can interact with IDE. So we'd have a pluggable area here, which can open a panel here, right? Like these could all in theory be plugins and you could write your own. Like for example, WP GraphQL ACF could have a plugin here where you click and you could see your field groups and then you click the field group and it writes a query for you or whatever. Um, or uh, your auth plugin, for example, could actually have a plugin here that could let you configure auth or like whatever you need to do. I know Jeff, like with WooCommerce, has like different tokens he uses for WooCommerce. Like theoretically, he could have a plugin down here or hook into one of these panels or like whatever. So the idea is to make all these like areas pluggable, right? Um, and my hesitation, my hesitation to your point about like merging it into core before was like, hey, if I'm iterating on these pluggable areas uh, and I want to make a breaking change, I don't want that to be breaking change to core, right? Um, and then have to like have a semver like 3.0 to 4.0 of core WP GraphQL because I renamed a JavaScript function that has nothing to do with actual WP GraphQL, right? And so that that is a that still is a a bit of a fear. Um, and we may have to address that at some point, but the current state of the IDE, we ripped out those pluggable ID, uh, pluggable areas for now. So the current state of the IDE doesn't have those. And so we're going to continue iterating on those separately. Oh, problem solved. Yeah, exactly. And then when we feel like those are pretty darn stable, then, then we would merge it into core. So if you want to be on the bleeding edge and use the pluggable version, you still go get that from the separate repo. Uh, but uh, if you want to use the stable version, the limitation is like you wouldn't be able to add like your own code yet. But I don't like I only know of one person, maybe two people that were actually plugging into the previous graphical anyway. Um, maybe more people are doing it that I don't know about. It, uh, but even like a quick search on GitHub for the actions and filters that existed, like if people were doing it, they weren't doing it publicly. I'm using it on one client, and it's literally just a tool tip to to client docs. Like, there's we don't we don't need to do that through graphical. I could just hook it up earlier. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, but but I do think if we can get it right, I I mean I don't think it's going to be like the most popular thing in the world. But I do think oh, I have a long list of ideas. Dozens of people at least game. would would use it, right? Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's really cool. We're like we're trying to take advantage of like a lot of the patterns that Core is doing with JavaScript, like using Redux stores to like handle pluggable things, right? Like when you register a block type, it's a list in Redux, and your block gets added to that list. Or if you unregister it, it gets removed from that list, and you can use Redux Dev Tools to you know visualize the data under the hood um, and things like that. But like we 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 kind of have to deconstruct a lot of graphical and then reconstruct it in a way. So like like for example, if you look at like the this feature of the Explorer, when I click this button, right, it has the ability to fire an action that modifies the document. And if I change the document, right, like if I just delete that or whatever, this knows that something changed and it reacts, right. Um, and so that state, like we can do this all internally very easily. I mean, very easily because it's all one component and it all shares state. But uh, when third parties on queue scripts, they don't have access to the internal modules, right? Like the, the assumption with the most JavaScript projects is that you're going to build, you're going to bundle everything together. And so every instance of every JavaScript object is the same instance but when you do third-party code like the public apis have to be on the window right that's why gutenberg like when you're when you're editing gutenberg everything is wp dot something on the window and so we have to basically take all of these internal apis and expose them publicly on the window and but it's more complicated than that but that's like, like that's the simplest version of it but we're going to take like all these all these stateful things in graphical and make them redux stores similar to what gutenberg does um and then any public any third party code will be able to on queue javascript and access the functions via a window global like wp graphql ide or, or whatever it is um and then so you'd be able to yeah any third party would be able to 
register a plugin like this. They'd be able to register a utility like one of these types of things. Um, they'd be able to register a tab here, a uh, toolbar button here. We're going to introduce a tab area on the other side too for the response. So like when you when you execute a, a response uh, or a, when you execute a query, uh, right? Like if, if you want to, for example, change the view from JSON to a table, for example, like there'd be buttons up here for that kind of thing. Um, there'd be a toolbar similar to this for the response on this side. And there'd be a tab area too. So that like, instead of just seeing the full response, these things would each have their own tab, right? Like I could look at the data alone, or I can look at the debug information alone or the query log information alone or whatever other third party information. Like if, if you wrote your own extension, you could also write your own tabbed view to inspect that, right? Um, so that, that's kind of the, the goals of where we're going, but like all of that is mostly going to be additive now. So we ripped it out and as we iterate on it, we'll iterate it on separately. And then at some point in the future, we'd merge that back in when we feel like it's stable. So that was a lot of talking to get that point across, but, <laughs> but yeah, that's, uh, so anyway, that's my short way of saying, I think, I think we can move this into core sooner than later. And I think 2.0 would That's be a awesome. good time to do it. So then I don't have to like have this limbo area of like supporting bulk. 100%. Um, how, do, how do folks feel about, okay, one, like the, the, this interface, the drawer, like I think it's pretty dope. Like, is there any general feedback about that? Like, do you think it's cool to be able to open it on every page? Do you think it should be the default? Um, like we also have a dedicated page too, so you can, you can come, oh, that's the old one, um, but you can come open it on a dedicated page, but the, yeah. So anyway, anybody have thoughts on that? Like, is it annoying that it's there? I, I think as long cool. as it, I, I think it's cool. As long <laughs> as it's hideable, um, I think like, it's great to like be trying to debug a post and just being able yeah. to be on the post list and not having to have yes. like one tab up with the graphical and then be switching tabs back and forth to like make sure like what we're getting is like what is stored in WordPress, like from a debugging perspective, I think it's great. Yeah. Cool. Um, oh, one of the, one of the first like consumers of the pluggable APIs though, will be smart cache. So for example, like, um, cause smart cache, one of the features of smart cache is the persistent, the concept of persistent queries, right? And that ultimately will probably make its way into WP GraphQL core sooner than later, um, hopefully. But the idea would be like when you're writing a query here, you have the execute button and you have a, all these buttons, but you'd also have a save button, right? You'd be able to save it. And then you'd have a tab over here for collections, right? So like you can see, you can see your history now, but you'd be able to see a list of saved queries, right? And then you'd be able to click on a query, you'd be able to open it, and then there'd be there'd be a like a document settings here where you can like add a description to it. Uh, we have like controls for like your max age header. So if it is cached in a get request, what's the max age it should be cached for? Um, things like that, where you'd be able to like add settings up per query. Um, we have like a allow deny rules too. So like if you wanted to, like if there was a malicious query, like, or whatever, like you could explicitly block it from being allowed to execute. Um, like those are features that we have today in, in smart cache. And it's like making that interface easier by using graphical. That's some of the goals we have as well. Um, and then like longer term, like there's this preference panel, for example, with short keys, like it'd be cool at some point to allow you to filter this and like map your own keys. And you know, like that, that'll probably be down the road. Like that's not a super big priority for me right now, but like things like that we want to enable. Um, I know Joe wants to introduce like more themes too. Right. So like at some point we have the light and dark theme. Dude, warns the guy before you do that. <laughs> What's that? Flying to my retinas with a light mood. Yeah. Bro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. You're going to like have a seizure now. I, I, I'm watching people's faces like light up on their. <laughs> <They're>, yeah. <clears throat> but uh, yes, yeah, so I think that's the plan is like get this, get this into people's hands. 
let them start using that. Uh, obviously, then we'll get feedback too on it faster. Like, hey, this sucks. Like, why? You know, or whatever. <laughs> or this is awesome. Like, where's this put my whole life? And then that can help us inform like some of the pluggable APIs as well. I think folks will be like, hey, I wish this could do X, Y, or Z. Or maybe nobody gives us feedback. I don't know. That's usually how things work. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, man. So I, I, I think that's, the, I think that's kind of the plan. Is there any, does it, after, we talked about this, what, a month ago. Is anybody else have any, any thoughts on any of these topics? So the Semver auto update, I know you've prototyped some stuff, though. Yeah, I can have... go into, I can go into some updates and details just on all of these. I'll actually get to uh, find out. Uh, so Semver. Um, I've got, I don't think I opened up a PR because I got distracted by essentially duplicate work. Um, I've got, uh, some clients that I've got to manage auto updates for, so I'm going to use those patterns to reinform what I've been doing, but, but like the API is, is there, it's, it's mostly done. It, what it really needs is the, just the front end UX, like where exactly we're tabbing into it, especially now that 6.5 kind of changed all of the, all of the hooks on the, uh, on the plug and install page. So there's a little bit of work that has to be done by there, but um, that's getting closer. Uh, feature flags, however, there's um, there's a draft PR up. Um, it doesn't work, but um, you can already take a look and just see like what the proposed API is, specifically for experiments, um, how it'll look, um, how it'll be easy to create from core. Everything will just have its own experiment file that just has a, a name, a config, related settings, and then you know the link to the actual functionality plugins that have to happen. Um, with with a long term idea of like letting this be be extendable as well, that might not make it into 2.0 just because like we're trying to solve our own problems before we're trying to solve uh, third party problems. But but like it's being built with that in mind. Hopefully. Um, hopefully in the next two or three weeks, this should be ready for review already. If nothing comes up client side, um, this is getting close. Um, what else is on my list? Oh, just another mention. Um, this isn't part of, um, this isn't required for 2.0. This is just work I'm, uh, doing on the background, the, like doing a connection resolver work, um, because like my clients and a lot of other extensions need it. Um, so the next step of this um, in our non-breaking backports, um, we're probably going to be uh, splitting um, the logic from the hooks in the actual methods. So like instead of like everything being dumped into uh, get whatever it is, there will be the prepare, which will be the overloadable logic that any like children or extenders can just use to hook and change. And then separately, that will all be wrapped in a in an instance getter. So we'll only ever have to apply the hook and instantiate the call once, which will solve a bunch of open issues um, and deal with a lot of the, um, hopefully deal with like a lot of the um, extra complexity um, in large plugins like uh, WooCommerce and TDC and, uh, and uh, yeah, and large plugins like that. So that's what I've got going on in the background that I can speak about. Um. Oh, one thing. Oh, one thing that was on my mind, and maybe this is a 3.0 candidate because it would be. It would probably. Well, there might be backward compatible way to do it. Um, the the performance issue with like descriptions that we talked about. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, that, we can do that backwards compatible. I think. Yeah, I I think, and maybe we talk about this separately, but I. I think what we are so like when you register an object, like currently the the. The function, what am I, what's the word, like fingerprint or whatever, like whatever the, the shape of the function, like you you give it a name and then you give it an array of things. Yes. I think that if if that instead of an array is a callback itself, like like if you think of add action or add filter, you, you're not you're not actually doing the thing in the second argument. You're doing a callback that then does the thing, right? Like you well, register at, at, so, at and, some and point. I, I think that if we can, if we make that a callback instead of an array, I think that solves a the lot entire, of problems. The entire config object? I think that solves a lot of problems. I'm not 100% sure, but I, I think a lot of the things, because like what's, what's happening right now is you're registering a type and it has all this information being added to the registry immediately. 
uh, versus only when called, right? Like basically you want to like kind of like the ad action, oh. you're saying, hey, I want you this action to be aware that a callback exists. So if you ever call me, do action, now now execute the function. But instead we're right now, I think part of the problem is that we're we're adding all this information, including executing descriptions to these arrays that get added to this registry. When really we just want to say, hey, we want to reference this function in the registry. And if we ever get that type, then call the function. But I think right now we're we're so we're yes and no. Yeah. Yes and no. Um, I because ultimately, it's not the array that's the, like I'm all for objects, not for call, callables. But like ultimately, it's not the array itself that's the problem because there's data that we need in that array at all different points. It's that certain keys in the array, like description or like whatever, or possibly even all of them, just the individual like array values should all yeah. be able to be value slash callable to that value. Yeah, I think that solves it more. And like, listen, we can we can make the whole thing callable, but that just means that when we need the type name, we're still going to load all the other things in the. Yeah. Field. If we want to, if we want to make even better type safety, but a huge breaking change, like honestly, configs like can be a class in in WordPress seven point four and above, and like that would also um, in, improve like memory loading and like improve DX. Yeah. But it'd probably break most of the ecosystem. Of, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Even with like an array access uh, comment. Um, so there's definitely work to be playable here, but as far as just like a uh, back compat like an easy back compatibility fix as we as we try to go on, I think we can just make all of the relevant sometimes. fields yeah. just make them string slash callable, especially description, especially like anything that has a translation. Although good to know um, WordPress 6.5 shipped the performant translations feature. So that performance gap just got significantly reduced. Um, have you, have you, so I don't do a lot of internationalization, so I don't really suffer. I haven't really suffered from the pain points. A lot of people have reported personally. Um, uh, anecdotally. You, um, yeah. I was going to say, have you seen yeah, like so, tangible benefits? So anecdotally from, I've, been seeing, um, hold on, let me actually not talk out of my ass and see what my last. Is your air fryer it, cooking faster? Is what yeah, asking. for real, for real. Um, so like I'm seeing anecdotally around like a 20% increase um, improvement just on, just on the switch from 6.4 to 6.5, which again, like depending on like the query, like isn't going yeah, to like sure. amount to that much. Um, it has closed the gap between us and rest, which is nice. Like there's still that extra overhead because there's still millions or tens of thousands of those translation functions still being called and each of those has a little bit of overhead, but the gap has gotten a lot less. And then with stuff like caching, it doesn't really matter. The gap is non-existent. So a lot of times we even come out on first. I'll hopefully have more to share in general. I've been doing some, uh, uh, RT Camp has been doing some uh, performance bench, uh, benchmarking and some like ecosystem uh, uh, strategizing, as it were. And so hopefully I'll have like some more concrete stuff to uh, to code in public and share as soon as I get approvals from the from the bureaucracy. What's that? And I get what is uh, this totally tangent from anything we've talked about so far? But like, what are so I I personally use Faust right for like my front end of choice at the moment, which is a WP Engine framework built on Next. What are other like what are other folks like using for front ends right now? I'm just curious, like to get a pulse. Like, uh, uh, I'll just keep right in the chat. Routekit and Astro. Yep, uh, that would be definitely. Svelte kit, uh, Next.js 14. Um, I don't hear too much about like Remix or what else is out there. It's a lot of like Nuxt, View, Next, and uh, some Svelte kit sprinkled in questions in the headless discord. That's what I see. I've seen some Astro stuff. I've never Astro. done it, but I've seen I've seen some cool Astro stuff. 
what are i so for folks that are doing like a lot of client are so for agency work i'll put it this way yeah. um when i'm handing off projects to clients and expecting them to um, maintain the front end so we'll usually go to nextjs just because that's where the front end developers are um but but like i've had but yeah there's like a whole view next uh sub community that like i've had the pleasure with uh yeah. with trying to understand the front end for i wish i did it's cool stuff i just yeah <laughs> it's it's hard enough understanding one front end framework i just want to work Seriously. in PHP, man i'm in the wrong field so also so for folks that i guess so it's probably really just the two of you alex and would um are uh, how many how many sites are you like are you doing regular like headless consulting now alex or no no i was a uh, i was curious to get a pulse on like what what like uh business reasons like i have my own theories but like i was curious on like what what convinces a business that it does make sense to go headless versus not like i've I have my own theories and opinions and could sell it one way or another, but I'm curious, like what in the real world, what yeah. is causing people to make that decision? If I, it's a good question. You first, think, Alex. I mean, all my data is a couple years old and a little foggy. Yeah. Um, I felt like there was some amount of developer drive right of like yeah. we don't want to work in wordpress there's that aspect of it um i think of what we saw with like android authority was that they were in a place where one of the you know they were gonna have to ditch wp engine and go to one of the you know maybe vip could have like vip probably could have met their needs as far as hosting on traditional wordpress and scalability or they would have had to go to custom hosting solutions right because they were with the vertical scaling wp engine was doing or does we just couldn't meet their needs anymore or we're close to not being able to meet them and um, that was that was for monolithic wordpress or for headless monolithic. okay okay so j regular well, wordpress wasn't meeting their needs right like performance wise and scalability wise it was okay we were there at the upper limits, or at least this is my understanding of it, if I recall correctly, was there at the upper limits of what the WP Engine platform could do. And so, and I think in combination with maybe where their developers were going and what they wanted to do on the front end, going to a headless solution meant they didn't, they could actually scale back on their WordPress hosting and scale up on their front ends hosting separately right um and i think the third option that i haven't seen a lot of but i think makes headless the most interesting is the like uh what's a fancy term for it basically having multiple clients right like your web clients just one client if you want to federated yeah you know, it's federation or whatever um yeah like is um having m multiple multi-distribution channels <laughs> yeah that was like that was my our first use case when like when i was first working on yeah federation for you guys yeah was across various yeah I, yeah I, I'm, just, I'm just curious like what uh because i like i have my theories and i i have my reasons for why it obviously makes sense but i don't know if it always translates to the people Ultimately I mean, making I, the decisions. I kind of wrote an article on this. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll just add a little bit to what Alex said from my experience. Um, first, um, really important distinction to make is the difference between performance and scale. And two or three years ago, especially with GraphQL hype, like no connection to, to WordPress WP GraphQL, yeah. a lot of people. <coughs> We're we're coming at like GraphQL as this this cure all at, like and yeah, just headless yeah, in general yeah, as yeah, this yeah. this cure all for performance and it's not about yeah. performance it's about scale it's about yeah. when you really need to reach those for whether it's monolithic whether it's traditional whether it's just having like the different like abilities of like what you can cache what you can 
develop separately, scalability in all its aspects, including the tech debt. Like that's where I think it really, that's where I've, I've found the need has really settled around. Um, the other one being is custom um, user journeys. Yeah. Uh, like custom UX flows that you really just can't get out of traditional WordPress. Now with the 6.5 interactivity API, like some of that might settle back downstream, but we'll see how that goes. Um, and then the last case, especially at enterprise that I've been seeing a lot is the um, branding guidelines and marketers are surprisingly yeah. no longer engineers, but marketers are the ones that, that I'm now seeing driving this change or driving these, these new migration projects as they come up because they want to have that frictionless control of the front end while still benefiting from WordPress as a platform. And the way to do that isn't, let's say, I don't know, like smaller decoupled instances where inside WordPress you're using like the REST API to do some like fun interactivity, but you're actually saying like, screw all you plugins trying to hijack my front end. Yeah. These are my branding guidelines. These are my design tokens. I'm already creating these custom components using React in the back end. I want them to match exactly on the front end and have this custom flow that ultimately on enterprise is still scalable. So that's that, really it's the it's the enterprise at scale and not just enterprise as a whole that yeah. that the use case is really settling around at least for now. Um, that, I'm hopeful and I'm still assuming that barriers of entry is going to keep on dropping and there's going to be yeah. more and more use cases for it. Yeah. yeah. What what so speaking of barriers, what so I actually I think the component library and brand guide I think that is actually one of one of in my opinion is one of the more attractive things, but also one thing i don't think we have like great content on like not like me personally i don't but i don't think anybody in the community that i've really seen like has a compelling argument of like this is actually how you can be more efficient with headless you know and like here's why i i mean maybe it exists but right. i, I cannot don't, it's, it's confirm not like a, or deny <laughs> content marketing content. efforts <laughs> that rtk yeah. may or may not be working on <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like there, yeah. Yes, and, there is definitely an existing dearth of yeah. WordPress specific information about like sure. when, how, and whatever to do headless. I know Alex started doing a bunch of stuff, I think, before before yeah. he got caught up with real life, right? Yeah. I mean I just I just yeah. can't drop one other yeah, exactly. time right? along these lines. Like the because I'm going to make Yeah. But like my biggest pet peeve is like there's so many like REST versus w versus GraphQL uh, yeah, articles and, out there by yeah. Kingsta, by like the major yeah, hosting. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. like it has nothing to do with WordPress where A, you're already getting a REST API and B, you're already getting a GraphQL API, depending on which path you go. So like yeah. totally irrelevant. But like yeah. that's what that's what people are talking about when they're talking about headless WordPress. And yeah, yeah it's my yeah. biggest pet peeve. Yeah. And that that's that's kind of what I was trying to get out is like what? so the barrier to oh go ahead out so can you read it there uh, either of you like what what kind of content are you not seeing that you want to see um yeah like the i guess more more yeah more like business case for headless like how and one of the points to me was like the reusability of components and things like that and you know um because I I always thought that was going to be a, like a driving force with it, like especially for agencies, right? Like you can't really reuse themes that well, you know what I mean? Like uh, everybody would have like a, every agency would have like a parent theme and then they like extend it with this child theme and it was like a hot mess of a thing. But like with like component libraries, like, I don't know, think of like Shad CN and Tailwind or whatever, right? Like yeah. you could have this like, library of components that your agency uses and then with style tokens or whatever you can reuse that across many projects you could have one like agency npm package with a bunch of components and then like project a has different style tokens than project b but it's the same component library right you want to fix an accessibility issue for 100 clients you fix that one component and 100 clients just benefit with one update we're like in in monolithic WordPress. That's a that's a hell of a lot more of a process, right? Like you have to literally go to a hundred different. Like it is it, it's, it's a you know what what you could fix it in two lines of code and distribute it to a hundred sites that would you know just kick off a rebuild yeah. somewhere or whatever. You like in like monolithic, it's like damn, like that's a big effort. 
when you, you talk about components, you're talking about like, well, at least a block level, like paragraph components or header components. Sure. Maybe, yeah. Uh, all, I think all front any, components. anything, man. It could like literally, like, yeah. If you think of any like any component library, like Ant Design or or anything like that, right? It's like yeah. if I update to the latest Ant Design and they fix the accessibility issue, for example, all all I had to do was update that component, right? Um, where like in in monolithic, it's like, dang, I got this PHP based theme, and then and then like project A has child theme A, and project B has child theme B, and project C has child theme C, right? Like you're and they're not really there's not like a concept of shared. Maybe some agencies have figured it out on the PHP side to some degree, but I I've not seen it, right? Um, yeah, the, the delineation between multiple feature plugins and what's in the theme. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I so will. I... I will just cut in and say that something that that I personally love about Faust JS, and I'm one of the few people on this call, I believe, who is not or has not at one point been an employee of WP Engine. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but the thing that I love about it is it's one of the first frameworks in the ecosystem that finally started moving past like requiring everybody to reinvent the wheel. And started providing that baseline that people could like use composability to like extend and build on top of that. The, these patterns of like still like everything's being created for a specific project and that goes wrong. And like Lord knows if you're in the Discord, like there are parts of Faust that like in my mind still use that old like highly coupled in that sense uh, sort of pattern that like I wish they would rip yeah. out. Auth always jumps to mind. Um, I'm begging for that to change, and like one day hopefully it will. But but yeah, like slowly and slowly, I think the ecosystem in general is starting to like better embrace like component based design in general um, and just composability like Shad and the Jason, like that example that you gave is like, that's my favorite learning tool for like how yeah. to write good code is just looking how they like make that all extendable, keeping the context separate, like people, not the part that like people are copying the components themselves, sure. But just the way they're all structured, that you can just drop in a part of it into the parent class and everything parent class, parent component, and everything just adapts around it. And we should yeah. be doing a lot more of that, like yeah. building these headless WordPress frameworks. Like there's a lot of repetitive work that everybody's doing that like doesn't need to be happening anymore. So fingers crossed. Yeah, that was because you you made a point about barriers to entry, like in how can we lower? And that's what like I think we were trying to do with Faust is like what are the problems that if you go headless, what are the problems that every project is going to have to solve? Template right? hierarchy. Exactly. That, that was, that was a huge one. Right. Um, and then, yeah, authentication and previews. So it was like, sorry, Fred, it, you're giving the examples of all the parts of fast to hate right now. <laughs> it, oh, that you hate. It's, it's too coupled to a specific solution. It's not extendable. It's not pluggable. Which, it it which solves part, it for the, people. Um, the template hierarchy. No, post previews or, off. Post previews oh, and off. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, hierarchy yeah. is lovely. Okay, okay. I, I was going to say, dang, I'd love to hear more about why you think the hierarchy is. Oh, no, hierarchy is great, uh, although it does still need to be brought over to the app router, and it can be done. Can and it should, and it will. Yeah, I know. All uh, you see. <laughs> we have a dude, Caleb, Caleb Barnes, in the, in the yeah. Slack who's done it. But, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, and oh, Fran, we'll, we'll talk that, more. I'm not going to hijack this call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, that's fine if some of them are maybe too opinionated, but I think that that was the goal, is right. Like, what what are the general problems, and ultimately, how can we solve them? Ideally, in a generic way, right? Um, some of, some of it still is like probably missing pieces of core WP GraphQL too. Like auth, for example, is like still a like WordPress doesn't have native headless auth. Right. There's like kind of the application token or application password thing, but that's only like that's kind of a weird <laughs> not it's a kind of a weird thing. Um yeah, they don't even have uh like any way to extend it with the current preview uh filters. Yeah, there's that, a lot of that's a huge pain point for for Faust was like like not not honoring the existing post preview filters. Um, kind of had to hack it a little bit, but yeah, it's less of a hack. It's 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 just not as hardened as as we'd like. You know, it's kind of yeah. And there's a lot of the, weird. The first thing I do in every fast project is I have to replace the entire Apollo client, which like sucks because like most of it's great 
and also sucks because it's getting bundled regardless of if I'm using it or not. Yeah. But, um, but yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I yeah, I think long term even like not allowing you to opt out of Apollo would be cool too. I think you know, maybe. I, I think yeah, there's there's benefits too, but um, yeah, obviously downsides. Anyway, I was just, yeah, I was just curious to hear more about that kind of stuff. Um, I cool. wonder how much, and like honestly, we're already all tax volunteers, so like who knows? But like, I wonder how much effort like we can be putting into improving, um, like. I don't want to call it DevRel at this state, but like best practices, like kind of like thought leadership sort of stuff. Yeah. Like I know, like obviously like Fran's doing great work at WP Engine and, and right, Alex has decoupled and hopefully, hopefully RT camp will start trying to contribute some like, you know, ecosystem knowledge soon. Um, but just like, especially because these are new patterns and like it does represent a barrier to entry. I just, I think it'd be super cool if like, there was just like, you know, like thought leadership, like, yeah, yeah, Jason Ball's the the maintainer of WP GraphQL, but like, 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 do you have like the time to go around doing more talks like you used to no, or like, no, nah, I mean, right? I, we need no. two of you, man. Yeah, I know. We yeah, were I, trying I to plan back in the day, David, uh, sort of like a zoo, kind of a half hybrid in person or and Zoom um, WP GraphQL conf. Ooh. Jason and I pitched it, but um, you know, I, I think it just didn't get enough traction. In I terms would of... uh, a, a headless WordPress specific conf. Oh, I yeah. would love that. I know others who would love that. I'm sure yeah. sponsors who who really really want to want to pretend that they're that they're more involved than they are would probably also help <laughs> us out. Yeah. I, uh, would be I would whatever. participate. I right. El Elementor to... owns Stratic. That kind of counts as headless. Yeah. They love sponsoring yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And it definitely, yeah, headless more than just WP GraphQL, too. I don't think it has to be like WP GraphQL centric to get. I'm honestly, honestly, the best value. WP GraphQL builds I've seen use both REST and WP GraphQL. Like, yeah. they both have their best strength and weaknesses. Yeah, for sure. Nice. Um, I would love to participate. I cannot obviously like commit to organizing something like that so like uh, uh that's a yeah something i would not have the time to to organize or facilitate so but i would obviously love to participate if I said thing happened so i think right now my pro well i i finally have time again to start writing for wp uh decoupled again so if anyone has very specific things, and even if it's not like a specific idea, like an answer, like if you're like, what should we be doing around X, Y, or Z, right? Like you want at least someone to throw some thoughts on paper, like feel free to send those ideas to me, any of you. Um, oh, yeah. And then... Thanks, Alex. That'd be great. Yeah, I mean, on the conference side, I've, I've got nothing but time right now. So um, maybe... Uh, friend you and i should talk and yeah see what we can do cool yeah i'm down what else is on the agenda i, th I mean i think that's probably it unless yeah unless anybody else i think um yeah my my two like kind of big goals right now is uh a lot of stuff with the graphical IDE and then this 2.0 stuff, right? Let's uh, like the main, mainly the GraphQL PHP and the PHP, those are like my two biggest priorities. Of course, obviously general maintenance and like I have a lot of ACF support I'm still doing uh, since that launch, which that plugin actually passed to 2000 active users on .org too recently, which is pretty cool. It's only been out for a couple months, so. Um, okay. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been doing a lot of support with that still. But like, yeah, the, that's my biggest two priorities right now is stuff related to graphical and a 2.0. Um, and ideally, yes, yeah, send the cadence for how can we do breaking change releases in a way that doesn't split the community, right? Like, I, I would love it if, you know, 
the majority of people are on the latest or close to the latest. Um, but uh, I think this plan accounts for that. Yeah. I think I think we're as as someone who's like highly sensitive about Semver and has been bitching about like Semver yeah. and like millions of projects. Like with every chance I get a get a get a chance, like like I've been blacklisted from like ACF, <laughs> WooCommerce, Gutenberg. They're all like, "Oh yeah, someone's gonna complain about Semver. It's David again." Yeah. Um, so like, <laughs> I'm I'm pretty confident that that between auto updates, between feature flags, between the fact that like our first one, our first like 2.0, like our first like major point uh, point uh, breaking release, because like. Because zero point anything to one is always going to be like a breaking change. So like I think the fact that like we're keeping the the footprint small and setting the tone, like is enough to set us up for success. Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful. Like worst case, again we have we have like the some app zero metrics like here or there when we actually like need to check things. And between yeah. like feature flags and and just auto updates to make sure that like things don't break in the process. Uh, we've got it all covered. Uh, topics that we might want to figure out down the road is like, when are we dropping like minimum WordPress versions? And if that counts as a breaking change, considering that WordPress itself will just block the update. Um, so like some plugins don't count that as some I personally would, but like, we don't have to solve that yet. Um, yeah, I would suggest now that I'm just saying it out loud. Is that we probably want to up bump the minimum PHP, uh, minimum WordPress version as well, even though we don't necessarily have to. Yeah, but that's like, true. That's 5. true. 5.0 is long in tooth. I, yeah, that was a, uh, yeah, that, that, like, obviously, when I'm committed to support that is because the community was like, no, I don't like Gutenberg. I'm, you know, yeah, staying but not seven years later. Like, yeah, like yeah. that ship has sailed. Classic I, press is not a thing. Yeah, that I would love. And then, um, the, actually, Okay, this um actually brings up a sub point of this. I think we should like um maybe draft a policy on that. Uh, oh yeah, like, I love that. So that like, hey, we're gonna make updates that you like. Like we're gonna update to say minimum version is X, Y, or Z, but we're not gonna consider it a breaking change or whatever. Or we are going to consider it and just, but I yeah, like, and, and, and you'll know when that actually conditions people to like not be freaked out that it's a 4.0 because it's just dropping support for a WordPress version that was released seven years ago and doesn't yeah. have a Docker image anymore. I, I was going to say, I get that auto updates um, slash like the plugin library on org would not allow you to install that plugin because it's not supported, but would like composer block it. If or some other CLI, um, Composer would block it because it would be in our requires. Uh, okay, um, our our own Composer JSON. Okay, so, yeah. I just want to make sure we're not missing a channel where someone could install a non-supported. And, and we would something like that. Like again, like my sensitivity to some verse. So like I would want to test that to make sure that like the assumption, yeah. like just because like like the lovely engineers at Woo say say this like doesn't necessarily like mean that it's true so like i would like want to actually test that like really all aspects of of, of like an unsupported wordpress version that aren't coming through dot org are actually checked um yeah. like i agree with like the concern there but we'll, we'll cross that bridge yeah yeah because i would it. yeah for my own sake i would love to just have like an ongoing policy of like hey what you know at x cadence we're going to drop support for you know yeah, two I mean, versions back in, or whatever that Starting okay. starting with six point six, we're getting the admin UI refresh shoved down our throats. So, like in a few releases from now, right by this time next year, we're probably going to be having a conversation just discussing about like like what a revamp settings page looks like. Um, and like if we're still lugging around like pre six point oh, like uh, like something like or like releases still from like two thousand nineteen two thousand twenty, like we're gonna we're gonna run into headaches. So like, yeah. it's definitely not a today problem. Um, it definitely isn't necessarily a concern with 2.0 since 2.0 itself is breaking for other reasons. And going forward, I think, yeah, as we work on that policy that, that Jason, that you just wrote down, that we definitely want to consider. Yeah, one of, stuff. One, of, one of the things we're considering with settings too is like taking this page and having it also be like possible. Some, some of those. You know. 
as far as as far as flow goes, it, it wouldn't make sense to shove all of them there. And we also got to think about extensions. Maybe, yeah. Oh well, extension. Well, so every. I mean, the way that is built today, it's a PHP registry tabs, yeah. where you register, and then any field is shown here, right? Like, uh, so any field here could, in theory, be shown in a UI. If we only had one UI, it could be shown in this UI too, right? Without. Yeah. Like in yeah. theory, without if, any. If we're, re, if we're reusing like WordPress component, like WordPress controls, then yeah. 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 So it could be, you know, it could in theory be something here. We haven't actually done work on it yet, but like it could be one UI to interact with WP GraphQL, right? Um, Interesting. Possibly. Just in, in my mind, like IDE experimentation and like configuration for that is separate than like configuring like your actual site. And yeah. like how you want the site to behave. Like if we're started talking about like like what are what are future wish list items? Like right, having multiple endpoints or like specifically like authing um, like like a specific user? Like like I would yeah. wonder like if like it's in the ID, how hidden does that become? Yeah, it's hard it's hard to say. I I don't know. Yeah. Um yeah. But yeah, part definitely of, definitely cool. Like Yeah. In my yeah, head, part, it's like the it's like the settings page we're leveraging native WordPress settings, right? API. So then like, we're just adding a layer on top of that uh, tentatively to just add it in here. That's at least what's in my head. I'm not sure if that aligns with. Yeah. It, and yeah, it's no, not. No, that makes, that checks out. I just, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, my question is, is less <clears throat> about, um, is less about like, like how it would look or how it would work. Or like, okay. Gotcha. Accessibility movie, Cause like all that would be, it's more of like just a user workflow and discoverability question. Yeah. 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 Like mm -hmm. semantically, it feels weird being there. Or at least semantically, it feels weird if it's only there and there isn't yes. like another, yeah, like yeah, so way yeah, to make it more discoverable. Like even if just the settings link brings us into the IDs setting tab, like even yeah. that could possibly yeah. solve the problem. Yeah, exactly. Because because I was thinking like I do have other stuff I want to bring in here, like where you could potentially have a button here, and it, instead of showing the IDE, this entire thing is replaced with something else, right? Like yeah. um, like schema Voyager. I know you experimented with that. Uh, I know yeah, Alex yeah. has ex experimented with that. So like. If you had a schema button or whatever, this entire right side, instead of being the IDE, could be a different thing. Like I could click a settings and this would all be my tab settings. It could even look similar, you know, conceptually similar to this with the tabs when you have a plugin, but it would just be, it would be under one roof, right? Um, uh, maybe. I, I, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Like we'd have to do experimentation and stuff, but uh, I'm just trying to think of uh, like, yeah, like I don't know. That's cool. uh, just to you know, like uh, I don't know any any other thing. Like uh, I don't know, like local. I have local open right now, and it's obviously it's got the same similar interface, right? The left bar, <laughs> and you know, it's like, and even VS Code. When 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 we were mocking up a lot of like ideas for graphical, like we took inspiration from like VS Code, right? And it has like the left bar too, and you know, you you, you collapse WordPress's sidebar. It also looks like that. Yeah, exactly. It's like a common pattern. So like any, if you wanted to interface with WP GraphQL, like this is the WP GraphQL interface is kind of my thought, right? Like, and there's yeah. different interfaces within it, right? Like if I want to change yeah. like, you know, settings, like in theory, we could actually, if we wanted to, we could have some sort of higher menu like this type of thing too. Like I have, I have drawings for like what could be, right? And there's like a file menu and stuff in there too, but um but yeah like uh yeah like you using like this we like we call this the activity panel like in what we're doing like boom activity panel right like so like you can do all sorts of stuff here but then you can also replace the whole thing i don't know uh, we've, we've got ideas or like even postman for example postman like right like if you want to go to settings or whatever it's like a new tab, I think. It's weird. Uh, where, yeah, like it opens a tab. Oh, no, it doesn't. Oh, I could have sworn it used to open a tab. Maybe they changed that. Oh, man. I could have sworn if you open settings, it used to open a tab right here. That might, they might have changed that. But it could even be something like this, right? Like where it's like endpoint yeah, settings code opens or whatever. A settings tab. Yeah, so it, yeah, so it could just be like, it's a, a way to unify it. And then to our point that we were even selling just 20 minutes ago, like, 
uh, the reusability of components and updatability of components and stuff like that is uh, it would benefit me as a developer, you know, <laughs> and the maintainer. So yeah, having one point entry um, would be great. So that's a uh, that's one thing I'm I'm thinking about too is like how you know how how can we yeah I don't know, just bring every just make that whole experience a little bit more cohesive. Like if I want to do something with GraphQL in WordPress. This is where I do it, right? Oh, uh, just uh, some thoughts, and it, there'd be multiple ways to get there too, right? Like possibly, right? Like there'd be, uh, like context menus and you know things like that. You know what I mean? Who knows? That's cool stuff. Anyway, yeah, I think um, I don't. I don't have anything else. I feel like I'm probably taking a lot more time than anybody planned on. So. No, I'm always good for it, man. Happy to let folks know. <laughs> Jason and I will stay here for the next three hours. You all can leave. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously happy to stay, too, but I don't want anybody else to well, feel like they need to stay. We'll, we'll, we'll look at some more air fryer models. Uh, <laughs> that is true. Make make a nice little uh, Amazon <laughs> order. Yeah. Got to figure out the international shipping. Oh, sorry. What? It, so did you say this? Did you say this is ready for review right now? No, no? God, no. Good, no, no. Okay, I, okay. I will... It'll it'll go from being draft to to open or like I'll I'll ping you and other people at some point. Like I don't even have internal documentation yet for what's there. But I guess if you still have time then. Um yeah. Okay, so the the idea is like we can just walk through it, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna um, say so or you could share your screen. Yeah, I'll share mine. Hold on. Uh, God, but the so the idea right is that between Slack and Zoom. Window. I need a screen. Okay, screen. The idea, though, is like I would register GraphQL experiment or whatever it's called, and then that would come with like a uh, like a toggle in the settings page. I assume, right? That would allow exactly. me to like enable or disable, and then yeah, like so. So think uh, Chrome flags or like Google Labs experiments or literally like any sort of experiments. I think even uh, Gutenberg has them, uh, and WooCommerce. Like basically, like if we're on the back end. Right, there will be, is this the updated, right? So there will be a tab on the settings page for now and an ID 2.0, it might move somewhere else. That sure, will sure, have sure. like the exactly, it will have the list of experiments that people can enable or disable. And obviously there will be, um, right? There will be like constants and filters so people can either enable them uh, in code or whatever else it is and some are committed not to deal with the database. Um, but the actual way the API works is, right, we've got an experiment registry that has the list of all the possible experiments, checks whether people can toggle them, sees what's enabled and what isn't enabled. And then every single experiment is basically like, right, an identifier for the experiment, the config that the experiment needs, like if there's settings for it. Like, for example, if we're talking about, um, um, right, like custom, like, like new scalers. Like the new scalers as a whole could be an experiment in theory. And then like, there could be a checklist of like, which scalers do you want to activate? Like, I'm not saying that's how scalers should be handled. I'm just trying to like yeah, 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 make yeah. this as robust as possible. But like every single experiment will literally just abstract this. Um, we'll just like yeah, extend this class, right? Right. Give it a slug, give it a config, um, expose some, I don't have this here yet, but like expose like some settings that might need to be like toggled on the admin screen. And then just have like the entry runner, which if active, okay, now load this right experiment folder. So it'll be like graphical 2.0 experiment. I mean, we just ruled that out. A custom it's scalers like experiment or whatever else it is. Like it'll just be in its own folder. And if it's activated, then all that will run. And then, the and, then and then the migration from an experiment to production code. Like um, uh, oh, that's yeah, that's the, just uh, yeah, we, so we the, changed the experiment to status and like we 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 change the status to let know like it's already been merged or like it's gotten removed or whatever. Yeah, and and in theory, in theory, probably well, I guess it I'm trying to think. Um probably depends on the experiment, but I, I imagine the uh, most would I I guess it depends on the experiment. Like like custom scalers, for example. There there's two approaches with custom scalers. There's one we can register the scalers. And just let them exist, even if no field preferences them. 
and then until one we day, can update the and, actual fields and, yeah and then one day we actually make the change where it's like hey the content returns an html scaler instead of a string and date returns a date time scaler instead of a string and like so obviously that day would be like a major mm -hmm. update introducing scalers themselves could be a backward it, it compatible could, it could even be two separate mm. experiments yeah um, something that i've oh done yeah in my, yeah i have something i've done in my own work that isn't in this PR because I want to get like the minimum down is actually like having experiment dependencies. It's easy enough to handle. I, I deal with other stuff. Um, so like we could always add that in as well. So like there could be an experiment for like using the new custom scalers. And if that's activated, then like having the custom scalers is automatically activated or it's an option under the same custom scalers experiment or 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 any different combination the goal is to make this api as generic as possible while still keeping it as minimal as possible to like to prevent misuse uh, so the the idea here if i register an experiment the experiment gets its own tab and then I can uh, the, register exper the experiment will get listed on an exper on an experiments okay. tab right there will be a tab for the list of experiments and either Right. There will be if the experiment is enabled, then like you'll see right over there, perhaps some configs. If the experiment wants to, it can add basically like in PHP, each experiment is going to have its own init class. You can throw whatever hooks you want to and like customize like like WordPress or WP GraphQL as you want to as well. Like yeah. it could be an ex we were talking a little bit ago about about like a revamped um, a revamped setting screen like that yeah, could be sure. an experiment. Yeah, sure. Like. Like, yeah, all, all, like all the experiment does from a, from a technological perspective is if the experiment is activated, then run this init function, which like hooks every, all the custom code we want to. So it's the just a built-in plugin, essentially. The experiments API will be an experiment. You have to opt, wait, no, just kidding. You have to opt in to- I mean, cur currently in this code, yeah, you have to um, like, like the way I have it set up right now is that it's false unless there's a constant saying GraphQL experiments. So like, yeah, you have to yeah. <laughs> activate the experiment experiment. <laughs> that's amazing. So yeah. Um, yeah, yeah so that's the idea it. again. Like it's like, if, if you want to look around the internal API that I'm still playing with, it's great. Like, like go for it. I'd love feedback already, but like I yeah. haven't. Like other than inline docs, like I haven't documented everything and I want to yeah, use that's cool, that's cool, that's and cool. I want to use an actual like I wanna have an example experiment. So I'm probably gonna even though we've just decided that graphical is probably going to core, I'm, I, I'm probably gonna try to make that an experiment just yeah, to validate that's, this. That's here. fine. That's fine. Uh, I mean they exclude it, it from the yeah. actual ship, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I'm excited, um, and I could show you my horrible work on um, what is it? What am I working on? on the auto stuff? updater, yeah. yeah. But like again, six point five just like invalidated a lot of it. Where am I? Where's, let me see my diff. Is the required uh, plugins thing, or or yeah, just because the way they're no longer always <laughs> the same, the same hooks, and some of those have changed. What am I looking at? <laughs> uh, yeah, so like. Right, we've just got like our basic Semver logic. It isn't. It's a. It's a static util class, so that way, like plugins or anything else can use it because Semver is is really simple when like we're just doing a basic level. Like we don't need anything more than this. We don't need basic like more than basic checks. It works fine for other plugins in the ecosystem, and this way we don't get a dependency out of it. And then really, it's just a question about. And this is like where I'm at. Is okay. Well, where do we? display these updates like which of the millions of disjointed screens because obviously wordpress doesn't share the same api for all their different possible ways to update or activate or even mm -hmm. check if their updates or activations they all have a different api so like it's mapping out all of those and then just creating you know the the template partials to actually display the notices which honestly that's all the admin notice stuff that jason you've already shipped into core it's now just reusing that so this also has to be retold this hasn't been merged in what, four months, three months. This hasn't been rebased. So like, but like that's where it's at. It's, yeah, it's really just the DX. I can, I've got, I've got Jewish holidays this week, but next week I can probably um, clean this up and at least draft PR it. So if someone wants to take the baton on it or even just give feedback in this horrible early state, they can. 
<laughs> so that uh -huh. that's a, I mean, yeah, you have the same imposter syndrome I have because it, but it doesn't, give me, <laughs> it doesn't give me confidence when when you're like, hey, I have this feature, but it's in a horrible state. I'm like, but it's in a good state. If, I change if, the status. <laughs> I add twenty tags to it. I DM you in Slack. I I, I add it. I'm like, hey, everybody, new PR. It know, it know, adds. It it changes the white space alignment. I'm, I'm just merge you, ASAP. <laughs> you've put you've put like many many more hours of thought into this and it, if it's in a horrible state then like i i haven't put nearly I as mean, much thought into it it's in a horrible state for for shipping to core like like this is this is better than what i'm using in the gravity forms extension <laughs> like like i'm using like yeah plugin update checker and like my own horror like and like a much more like rudimentary version of this and like you know i would never Propose like that for for WP GraphQL core. We we have we have standards. People people use this code in real life. I know. Yeah. <laughs> um. What do we? Um. I can't even remember. Do we have a? Do we have a good issue that breaks down? Like. What that type of uh, feature should accomplish? Um, like an actual spec for Semver. No, for, like for uh for us implementing, yeah, this okay, okay. I'm just trying to think, and regardless of implementation, like mm -hmm. just just like, what our checklist is to yeah, make sure that it goes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, because like to your point about like all the all the UIs and whatever where it shows notices and stuff like that, like um, just having having that written down might. Yeah, I, I, I suck at remembering to create issues before I open the PRs. Because I think this is this is this is oh I have it open. Sorry, I'm not sharing my screen. Um, uh, let's see. Did I share? Yeah, so we have this uh, summer auto update enforcement. What problem does this address? WordPress loves auto updates, headless apps that rely on strongly type schema, not so much. <laughs> I, created an, I created an issue for this. You did. Um, as oh, we wow. get closer to closing out the non breaking backlog and start on the beat, <laughs> as we get close. <laughs> uh, closer, closer. I'm optimistic. <laughs> we should consider ways to enforce somewhere on the WP backend. Um, at a bare minimum, we should disable automatic updates, play some sort of notice confirmation dialogue. So I'm curious if we scope this out a little bit more. Now that you've done some experiments and have a rough idea, I wonder if we can actually scope this into like here, like yeah, here's like what the user experience quote unquote should be. Um, and yeah, then, I can I can wrangle this and turn this into a because I think that would help a checklist for you. You've put in a hell of a lot more thought into this than I have. And I'm ha I'm happy to put some thought into it for sure. Um but yeah it's, if you if you had ideas it's it's and less it's less thought this. it's less thought it's more just um just like a fun little quirk is that the three different it's either three or four different hooks that like WordPress uses to show notices and each have a slightly different API. Like it's, so that, I wouldn't call that a consideration yeah. as much as well, more just like an engineering yeah. don't forget. Yeah, it's fine. But like even just having a list of like yeah. if you know if assembler update is available, here's the four places in the admin where users should see X, yeah. Y, or Z warning. Like if that if that was documented somewhere and even a you know, even a mocked up screenshot or whatever, like it doesn't have to be done. But uh then that would give us stuff to discuss too. Like even even people who aren't coding or whatever, just like I could give it to some random person and be like how would you feel if this is what you saw, right? Or whatever. Um, and then I could still want it too. Like, does this feel right? Like as a user myself um, and things like that. And then I can contribute code. And then I also know what I would be buying into supporting long-term too, right? Like, <laughs> like yeah, 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 100%. Uh, Easier um, to, to give a go, no go when you know what you're actually signing up for. Yeah, because I, I, th I think the concept's important. Um, I don't, so here's the trick though, too, like, ah, man, all the, all the, 
it's all the projects I maintain, like I'm like the developer on, right? Like, so it, you know when something's coming to it, break. <laughs> in, yeah, exactly. In one way, in one way, I'm like, I, I'm a power user of WP GraphQL. I use it on like a lot of stuff, but like, I'm also not the user that I think is the best user for WP GraphQL. Like the, the organizations that have big teams, in my opinion, are the best user for this. And I'm not that, right? Like I'm the opposite of that. I'm a one developer that's ma managing the front end and the back end, which I think is a good use case too. But I think the best use case is the one where you have like a team Separate of, teams, yeah. you know, 10 people working on components and five people working on the WordPress back end and they're separate. These guys are not WordPress experts and these guys are not JavaScript experts. And like, how can you use your own, you know, the best of both worlds to come together. So I'm not that user. I used to be I, like when it first started, I was at an organization like that, but. Yeah. Um, so so like, I'm doing just the exact opposite through, like, transition. Like I, to, to that point though, what I was trying to say with that is like, when it comes to auto updates, I just let it roll, man. Cause I know it's going to break. Right. Um, and so I'm ready for it. Like I know when I click release, like, to go fix my thing, right? Like, but uh, so, um, yeah. so the the issue that I'm seeing with a lot of uh, enterprise clients, especially those that are like are relying on on like you know a continuous deployment, um, is that they'll because they care so much about Semver, is like they'll be right. They'll everything is going to be like through Composer, but then what happens is that they're on a host like. Like WordPress VIP or WP Engine, or I think GoDaddy now does this too, and like they don't they don't care that that you're using their Git push software. They see the outdated plugin. If you don't have WordPress specific controls set up, then they're going to auto update your plugin. And most, if you're not like a if you're not like well into the enterprise scene with that specific hosting company, you're not going to realize that until the first time your site's no longer building because something updated and like either you were using it wrong or there actually was a breaking change or whatever it is. I see this so many times with uh, WooCommerce and the events calendar specifically. Like, I mean, I see it with, with like some older WP GraphQL releases, like when we fixed bugs that clients have been relying on. Um, but like specifically like WooCommerce or the events calendar, or anything else, like when they're versioning templates or things like that, right? They really got to care about Semver and then suddenly right, something updates and bam, breaking change. Um, and things don't build. You're not going to find it for breaking change. You'll probably find it for after update, right? Getting fatal error. <laughs> like yeah, the... no. Um, what I was, I can't remember if I had an issue. I was looking for an issue. I had, so uh, like, um, services like, Apollo, uh, what or whatever they call their service now. It used to be Apollo Studio. What is it called now? Is uh, it still no. called Studio? But mm -hmm. like services like that or Stellate, for example, or GraphCDN, mm -hmm. Stellate. Yeah. Um, they and like even me and my CI, right? Like when we do a release, we check the previous version of the schema and the schema, new, yeah, and the new version of the schema. So that that was actually that's a that's one thing I've been thinking about for a long time. If we want to. If uh, I've always been on the fence, should that be something that is in WP GraphQL core or does it belong as an external service or can it be both? Um, but basically the idea is like anytime we're able to detect that your schema has changed, we store a copy of it. However we store it, I'm, I'm not sure yet, probably like honestly in a custom post type of some sort is probably my first thought, but like we have, then we can have your versions of your schema over time. And then, like, if and when your schema breaks in in a in fall a way back. that we can identify, well, not fall back. You can't fall back, but you can at least fall. You wouldn't be able to fall back because you'd have to be able to tie it to your resolvers, and like it would get, you'd be able to it would, schema. It, and you would at least that. yes, you would at least be able to say like, hey, your schema had a at least possibly breaking change. It's only breaking if you have a client that's using it, right? Like, uh, but like we can like. If you're querying for posts and I don't, or like, like the post. By, Honestly, it could even just be a. Like I mean, if like we remove just, a deprecated mm. field, for example, like post by has been deprecated for like five years. It's still yeah. there. One of these days, maybe in the 2.0, we finally remove it and just say, hey, this thing's been here for five years. 
it's no longer Goodbye, here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you could be with a schema diff, you could you could see that, oh, on this date, like the schema changed from this to this. Here's the diff, here's the fields that were removed. We wouldn't we wouldn't have enough information necessarily to tell you like mm -hmm. which application is gonna break or if any application is gonna break, but it could at least inform you that something in your schema has changed. So I've I've been if we want to go into scope creep, smart cache will let us know exactly what's broken. Well, <laughs> you know? right. This maybe. this cached query no longer works. If, We've just like if, limited. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. That's it. if yeah. I, I if, think it's like a using... minimum. I think it's just um, like a minimum viable like uh, like a like a first step on this. We really so that... could even just like have just a notice on the back end, right? Your schema has changed, right? Right, yeah, yeah, like I would only I wouldn't refresh I mean, to clear the gray cache or something like that. Well, it, the schema itself. Well, no, it's yeah, it's more about like like okay for a com. A in general, example, I think we should be caching introspection. I think that we need to do a better. Uh, job that oh, that's internally. oh that that is better with the newer IDE to yeah um, yeah yeah because it like it can validate easy yeah yeah that's better with it um uh but but regardless. The, the bigger thing, like, so common situation, ACF, for example, mm -hmm. a lot of people that don't realize that ACF field groups are going to change the GraphQL schema are responsible for updating ACF field groups, field right? Groups. And so if, like, if you're like, hey, our PHP side is no longer using this field, but your JavaScript side is, and you go remove this field because, like, you no longer need to edit that field, but your Next.js app is querying for that field. Guess what? Your Next.js app is broken now because it's executing a query for a field that no longer exists. But so where like, do we sh want to show that? We probably want to exactly, show that to the in, JavaScript developers. I, I do. Or is it a or is it a war is or is it a warning in ACF before you before it, you hit save field? It, anywhere like that anywhere. would be a great place mm -hmm. too but but acf is a, you can also register field groups in json or php too so it's uh, not just a ui thing right yeah uh, or like let's say you had a post type registered and you're like hey we no longer use this post type right like you no longer edit content of that post type so you think it's safe to remove without realizing that your javascript front end was consuming that post type and all of a sudden it's broken Yes, like they're gonna they're gonna be notified that there's an error, but they don't necessarily know why. Like they know that it no longer exists in the schema, and they're gonna reach out to the WordPress team and say, "Hey, what happened?" And if so, if you had a log of like, "Hey, your schema changed on this day and this day and this day," oh, but on this day it changed in a breaking way, and here's what broke. Like I think that I think it's a dope tool. So anyway, I've been I've been contemplating whether like it belongs this. in core WP GraphQL. Or if it actually belongs in a service, like a third party that monitors your schema for you and can tell you, like uh, the guild, are you familiar with the GraphQL yeah, of course. guild? Like they have a service you can hook up for that, right? Um, but like, I mean, and people can do it on their CIs. Like, yeah, and that's what like, I Just like that, we do. That's, yeah. that's what I do. And I have an article like on ACF, on my ACF docs, I mentioned that. I say, hey, I recommend like you set up a tool like this in your CI. But I think I think it's even better. Like I'm, I'm not necessarily even better, but like I think it's it would be a great thing I agree. if WordPress administrators were able to identify the people who want to pay attention site to health. it in WordPress. Site exactly. In, ge in general, yeah. there's a bunch of site help tools like, that would probably be helpful. And then like so, it could notify you like, hey, mm. I don't have enough information yet to be able to tell you it's for sure a breaking change, but I can tell you your schema changed in a, a way change, that yeah. might be a breaking change. A hundred percent. The issue, just just tangentially, uh, the issue specifically about like auto updates causing breaking changes, is actually about is not actually, but like is less about when the front end's building, yeah. Because like again, they have CIs for that, and it's more just when the back end updates, and now the front end is I don't know revalidating or something. Well, so it like, could be dynamic. It can be dynamic things too. Like if you have like a like exactly. Mutation, that's what I'm. Yeah, yeah when yeah, it's not yeah, when it's yeah. not a build, and therefore there's yeah. no like there's no reason to trigger the CI on the front end. Yeah. So like that's where the front end team runs into issues because like right everything is working fine, and then suddenly yes. like the host yeah. updated something like there like any CI they had set up because it didn't happen yeah. in in their repo. It just doesn't get noticed and, until either a client reports it or until they trigger a build and, and suddenly things are failing. Yeah. 
and so so fe- a features, service would fix that yeah yeah fe- and uh yeah exactly like and that's why i'm like does it belong in word i think i think having it start in wordpress is okay though yeah right like stream for example stream the plugin like that uh, that was <laughs> That started in WordPress that became a service and then people cried and it went back to being a plugin. <laughs> um but like it could start in WordPress and then you can be like, hey, the value is there, but it like WordPress for it to be the most ideal, like an uptime monitor doesn't make sense to be in your site, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like and so that's it like uh <laughs> that's it that's uh, one of the things I've always contemplated is like, does it actually make sense to be in WordPress because the thing that's breaking it could be the thing itself, right? Yeah. And like, but I'd say majority of the use cases is like stuff like I said, like ECF or like you custom post type UI or whatever. Like you did something. The user makes a change via, think, via yeah, something think, that doesn't have programmatic tooling. Yeah. yeah. And you don't realize the side effect that's going to happen. And so I think for a majority of use cases, it would be pretty beneficial. Um, so anyway, that that could be a, a decent experiment, right? Could be. That'd be a great experiment. Um, I don't even think it'd be like at least an MVP of it. I don't even think it would be incredibly high effort either. You um, store you right you you store but, copy of the schema and WP content. Yeah, um, exactly. And uploads and and then you just check it periodically. Yeah, you compare the, the basically every time you compare, you just compare the last two versions, the newest and the most recent yeah. one, and. Exactly. Obviously, you'd have the ability to compare any version. Like, hey, what's changed between today and September twenty fifth? Or like, you you could potentially do like comparisons like that. But like the any like the revision diff viewer or whatever. Like, you could even use something like that to like actually exactly. view the the diff. Like, you would print it out to SDL like this the SDL and just show it in like. How mm-hmm. large is the is just the course schema? Uh, uh pretty large. Three hundred. I KB actually printed shipped. it on in paper. Oh, I just time. meant side paper. <laughs> <laughs> this is your spec. <laughs> <laughs> Please leave your notes in in red marker. Um, okay, so three seventy three KB is core. And I'm sure this gets larger when other plugins are enabled. Is, is, does WooCommerce include a schema in their releases? Let me look. You're still sharing your screen, just I for... I know. I wanted to show okay. you the tweet. Ah, okay. <laughs> when oh. you take print <laughs> schema to the Oh god, that's lovely. <laughs> uh releases assets. Okay, so Jeff isn't generating a schema with the releases. Let's see Gravity Forms is. That should probably increase the schema because there's a lot of interfaces in that. Oh, look, I have have a... Yeah, okay, so just just to keep all this in mind, um, a a bare-bones WordPress with a a bare-bones WP GraphQL with WP GraphQL Gravity Forms, Brings brings the schema up to eight hundred eighty KB. So what? what versus we, what, versus three hundred eighty. That's regular. That's just like one copy of a schema. And WooCommerce is even heavier than that. So one one potential thing we could do instead of instead mm. of storing the entire schema every time we could it's just well, store no, it. Yeah, because no, if you want to do a you, yeah, you story. have to you have to have the schema. Yeah. Um, which, like, honestly, if you're enterprise and you care about this feature, like, we just like let you know how large it is, and yeah. and make a button that lets you like easily clear like the a, old ones and yeah, set yeah. a retention history and problem yeah, solve. Yeah, 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 exactly. But just, like, um, but yeah, just um, especially like I, I wish I had a copy here, but like, and you start like, with something like small. the interfaces, the interfaces on WooCommerce, like the GraphQL schema gets so bad that it breaks, that yeah. it breaks tooling. Like I have to use Cogen in any project. Is I have to use like gra- speaking of uh, the guild, so I have to use their GraphQL Cogens like new preset, which sadly does not work well with Next.js because like the old version where like that just generates individual types, the schema from from Woo just because of the way that they're all set up, and I'm sure ACF is also probably heavy as heck. Like you probably don't generate the schema with custom data on your release. 
but like I can only imagine how large it balloons with all those interfaces and objects. Yeah. Oh, it's big. Um, like ACF field group, for example, this is, I have an interface. So any ACF field group implements the ACF field group interface. So like, this is a, this is one I imported from a user that has however many ACF field groups this is like mm -hmm. a couple hundred, I think. Oh gosh. Yeah. But like, I mean, the, the schema is right. There was, like, there was that one, there was that one person in Slack the day that shared a, Right, and it's any uh, .json file of just ACF fields that was something like two megabytes. Yeah, I, uh, it was like yeah. thirty thousand lines. Yeah, it's super. Yeah. It's, it's a lot more common than, especially in ACF. Dude, I helped someone recently. Mm -hmm. Two hundred and thirty-four ACF field groups. Field groups, yo. But I imagine. but, dude, I can load their schema now. Like I, yeah, I thought I was gonna have to rebuild like all of WP Graphical ACF because I I was like crap, mm -hmm. like. It was that, but like we fit. Well, I found a culprit of it, and uh, like their schema with two hundred and thirty four ACF field groups, like loads like in a second in the IDE now. Like, yeah, we still it, we still need to cache it on the on the WordPress side. Uh, not really, because no, I mean, really, because the way that things currently happen is that like we're still like a lot of the times like there's a lot of stuff that even though we're not doing full introspection that that still has to get regenerated in every single request it that's should. not necessary if the schema is not changing then like we can use the same wp cache get for but how how do you know the schema has changed is because it's all ph it's all like what event invalid just keep it in the same request you don't have to store it in a transient or an object cache like it oh, can just oh, be like in like per... live memory yeah so what is like just I per get... life cycle maybe we could out, we could cache out. it Point out what isn't being cached, maybe specifically. Cause yeah, when I it should be, yeah, what when I have bandwidth and like move on to the next stuff, like I've got a whole performance to do list of okay. topics Cause, to cause discuss. The, yeah, because the full introspection, like, it shouldn't be ever executed. Yeah, no, it's it not the full introspection. It. It's just, but but just even just like generating like the basic type tree is something that like within the same request. Happens a few times, maybe less now that interfaces are getting. No, that wouldn't affect it. it the well, issue. yeah, it's um, tricky. It, part of it's a life cycle thing, though, too, yeah. right? because like, because uh, like a plugin that hooks in and registers a new field like needs to be able to modify the schema within that request. So it's got to be. The, yeah, I think I think it's just um, it's just simple WordPress caching that has to happen. Just like right, not like object or anything. Just like the in memory WP cache set WP cache get. Right. And then, like at the end of this life cycle, like WP cache clear, yeah, or whatever that last. Yeah, I mean, is. I'm I'm open. It's definitely when you say introspection, I'm I'm thinking the whole thing. I'm like, well, yeah, that yeah, no, makes sense, but no, no. It's just in order to build like the basic semblance of the tree in order to figure out like the paths. Like, there's there's a good. I wish I had my XH prof. Do I? I cannot share them yet, but like it's I have some traces fun. that I can share. At some point, hopefully soon, that like we'll just show like the like what the like the repetitive calls are that can in theory be cached. Because yeah, yeah, just honestly, like yeah, just like turn on like uh, like graph uh, GraphQL like xdebug tracing or 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 xhprof profiling, and like you'll see if it's anything more than like 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 do posts and then like right below posts like do categories and then like run an xhprof and like you'll see the duplicate um in like the initial like building even before it's trying to resolve yeah um all right i am two minutes late for a different meeting um so until next month <laughs> yeah i mean i want any time in between oh uh, cool yeah see y'all yeah alex a pleasure as always hey jason quick question for you yeah uh, for sure free to jump david um I ran across thing as the other day, uh, open SSF scorecard. It's a, it's a project designed to help kind of give tangible scoring and like, I don't know, metrics is the right word for it. Um, on the security of an open source project. It's literally like a GitHub action you run that does a bunch of checks and all your merges. Um, and then you can drop like a token on your readme. Um, I ran it against our repo. We get like a 6.0 out of 10. So nothing great, but not terrible. 
Um, yeah. But it might give us some, you know, interesting things that, you know, work on to make sure we're, we're following some kind of best practices. But uh, yeah, that could be. It looks interesting. You want to you want to open an issue for it and then we can or whatever yeah yeah i can i can do that my and then yeah may, I, like if you've seen other projects that are using under whatever maybe like link some just for reference and so is it a paid service or is it like an open no it, no it's completely open source free Oh yeah, run manually on your or somebody else's project. Interesting. Yeah, so I just ran it against the WP GraphQL repo, and like some of yeah. the categories, we got ten out of ten on. Some of them um, were like five out of ten, and some were zero out of ten. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. I'd be curious. Yeah, that's that'd be. I'm um I'm curious, like who sees the reports, and because like obviously, if there's a big security vulnerability like you don't want just like every pr to like i mean you do yeah, want so, prs to expose it but you don't like it's tricky you don't like yeah this isn't doing security checks in and of itself it's checking to whether like like one of the ones we we failed was like oh you're not doing any kind of fuzzing right on uh, on your prs to check for security issues so you get zero out of ten there but you are at least doing automated dependency updates uh, so you get 10 out of 10 there. Like, it's not directly saying you have a security issue. Oh, it's saying okay. you like have the best practices, best practices in to place. help. Okay, okay. I see. Yeah, to make sure you don't have security issues. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm down, like, any anything like that as long as it uh yeah uh, sounds sounds good yeah i'll, I'll turn a few and get some info around it uh, it looks like it's probably fairly easy to set up install yeah. time less than 10 minutes we like easy things uh yeah. cool cool, cool. i will uh i'll do that i right, did have a good day